Hey, uh, grab your copy, would you, of the Word of God, and would you turn uh, with me? And uh, it's awesome to have in the in the building. We got some young kids in the room. It's awesome to have you here. And um, how many love having the kids in the service? Yeah. All the people who are clapping uh, don't have kids. <laughs> All the ones that have kids are like, yes, yeah, it's horrible. Anyhow, Nehemiah, um, uh, 30, 30 years I've been a pastor, eight years of youth ministry. I survived eight years of youth ministry. And uh, now this is a year, we just almost finished our 22nd year here at the church. Started, if you're new, we, we started with 40 people in a hotel. And by the grace of God, we've got a few thousand people that call New Life their home. And I was looking through all my sermons since 1997. I've only preached one sermon out of the book of Nehemiah in 30 years. And I've never done an entire series in the book of Nehemiah. I think my wife was doing her devotions a couple of weeks ago. And she just mentioned how cool Nehemiah was and said something like, you should do a a series on Nehemiah. So I thought about it and prayed about it. And so here we are today. Someone say today. Today we're kicking off a brand new series out of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to go. It could maybe 20, 25, 20, 30, 10 to 15 years. I'm just kidding. Just relax. It's going to be roughly about eight to 10 weeks, but we're going to kind of go chapter by chapter. And it's just an awesome book. And uh, if you have no idea where Nehemiah is, uh, kind of start in the book of Genesis and start working your way right. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is the Pentateuch, then Joshua, and Judges, and Ruth, and then you get to like 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Esther, and then the book of Nehemiah. If you're like at Psalms or Proverbs, go left. If you're in Revelation, raise your hand and I want to pray for you, because you're a long way off, all right? Uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, go ahead and meet me there. I'm going to read most of the chapter in just a second, but I want to, I want to kind of set it up, set up the, the message here. Who, who is Nehemiah? Nehemiah uh, lived 20, about 24 to 2,500 years ago. So about 450 years before the life of Jesus Christ, Nehemiah uh, lived, and check this out, he was a cupbearer, someone say a cupbearer, a cupbearer to the king. Now what did a cupbearer do? A cupbearer was kind of a glorified like butler. So he lived in the palace and uh, he was like number one next to the king and uh, he would have the voice of the king, the ear of the king and check out his job. His main job was to, uh, when, when they brought the king's food or drink or wine, Nehemiah the cupbearer would have to taste the food or drink the wine before the king did in case anybody poisoned uh, the food. How, how many would like that job? You're like, that'd be a bummer, right? If he was, they were trying to poison the king, but that was his job. And so lived in a palace, kind of a, a posh uh, 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 job and uh, number two in charge outside of the king. And, and we're going to see that God's going to use Nehemiah in a powerful way. Let me just stop right here. Would you look at me for a second? How many of you want God to use you in a, in a powerful way? Okay. If you don't have your hand up, then, then you need serious prayer, but uh, you, you want God to use you? Maybe not like He's using me right now, but we all want to be used by God. And the Bible says in 1 Peter 4.10, each one of us has already received a gift. You have a gift, a spiritual gift that God wants you to use. And so Nehemiah was one that didn't just sit back, but wanted to get something done. So he was a cupbearer, but here's the problem. He, he was a Jew. And if you know anything about uh, the Old Testament, uh, in, in 586, so 150 years uh, earlier in the life of Nehemiah, uh, he, again, he was a cupbearer to Artaxerxes Arta the king. Uh, in 586 BC, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, came and kidnapped all of the Jewish people and basically made them slaves. And what happened was they ended up burning down the temple. Can you imagine this? If somebody came in and burnt down our church? I mean, praise God that we can watch service online and we can have church online, but there's just something, come on, there's something about being together and although we can't hug one another right now. Uh, so they burnt down the temple and they, 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 they destroyed all of the walls. And back then, uh, the walls around the city would be protection and safety for the Jewish people. So uh, King Nebuchadnezzar took him captive, burnt the temple, burned down all the walls and the gates. And Nehemiah, who was living about a thousand miles away, um, was going through a difficult time and uh, pretty much the Jewish people lost everything. And uh, here's the theme of the entire book. I thought I'd give you that. And it's found in Nehemiah chapter two, verse 18. Look at the screen. Here's the theme of the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah says, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start. What's the next word? Let us start what? Rebuilding. So they began this good work. Here's the theme. They began rebuilding the temple after it was destroyed. They started rebuilding the city gates and the walls. So he says, let us start rebuilding. Now, isn't this like 
what we're going through right now in our culture. Like a lot of people that I'm talking to, even in our church, are in a season of rebuilding. We're getting connect cards. We're getting comments. We're getting, uh, having conversations with people saying, man, I, I was at this job for like eight years or 25 years, and, and I, I thought I'd be there for the rest of my life, and boom, I lost my job. So they're rebuilding their career. They're rebuilding their job. They're, many people are rebuilding their finances. Over 40 million Americans have filed for unemployment. So there, some, some in the room, you're, you're rebuilding after a divorce. Some of you are rebuilding after the loss of a loved one. And, and then in the culture that we're living in right now with the virus and the looting and the riots, and we're in a rebuilding time in America. We're in a rebuilding time in our church. We haven't for four months been able to do church like we've typically done church in the past. And so we're trying to find creative ways. How can we reach out to people? And how can we feed people? How can we meet the needs of the people in our own church? So even as a pastor, we're like, We've never done this before, and we got to have hand sanitizers and masks, and, and it's a time of rebuilding for our church, and Nehemiah was going through a time of rebuilding, and how many know that life is kind of all about rebuilding? It's like the Oakland Raiders, every year they're in a time of rebuilding. <laughs> Where's my Raider fans at? I know what you're thinking, like, this is the year, we're moving to Vegas, we got a new arena. <laughs> Nothing's going to change, except the ticket prices, so anyhow, uh, rebuilding, rebuilding. And the title of the message today, so the theme is rebuilding. The title of the message is when you can't take it anymore. Come on, someone say that out loud, would you? Have you ever, have you ever like, you've driven your car for so long and then it just like keeps getting dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. And then if you have kids, how many know it's even worse? There's Cheetos underneath the, uh, under the seat and you're just like, how can I live? And then finally you just kind of lose it one day. You're like, I can't handle it. I got to clean my car. How many know what I'm talking about? Or you can't, your house, is, you can't even get from the garage to the door to get into the house because there's so many bo- all over the place, so disorganized, or your closet, I mean, clothes are everywhere, and you just can't take it anymore, and you gotta go through the closet and organize and get rid of some stuff and take it down to, you know, to, to the rescue mission. It's like, I can't, no! and this is what Nehemiah's feeling. He's like, I, I can't take this anymore. I know that I'm a 1,000 miles away, but I can't take it anymore. I'm ready to read. Are you ready for me to read? Just say go. The Bible says in chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, son of, huh? What's his name? Huh? Help me. Come on. All right, that sounds good. Hakaliah. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, that that rhymes, Nehemiah, Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev on the Jewish calendar, that's September, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, One of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and all about the Jews. Now, I I told you that King Nebuchadnezzar went and enslaved the Jewish people, and a lot of them died. But notice here that there's still a remnant of Jewish people left. And then in verse 3, he says, they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. So this is a message for anybody in the room, anybody watching online that finds their self rebuilding something. Are you ready? I I really think that the three principles that I discovered in chapter 1 and part of chapter 2 that were true in the life of Nehemiah, I believe that are also true for you and I if, only if you're in a time of rebuilding. You ready? I'm going to give you three things. I think it would be awesome if you took notes. If you don't feel like taking notes, please take notes. If you're not in the mood to take notes, do it anyhow, all right? Here's three things that I saw in the life of Nehemiah that I think we need to adapt these three things. Are you ready? Point number one, that we need to sit down to cry. We need to sit down to cry. Verse four, the first part of verse four says, when I, Nehemiah, heard these things, I sat down and I wept. Notice this, that he first thing, he sat down. Has anybody ever been guilty uh, like I have been guilty of? Like when I see something that needs to get done, the first, I just start moving into action. When sometimes maybe I don't need to move to action right away. Maybe I just need to sit back a little bit, think about what is the best solution, the best answer, the best way to resolve this, contemplate it, maybe get a little bit of counsel on the situation. And I love that about Nehemiah. Although he saw the plight of his Jewish people, the first thing that he did was he sat down, he thought about it, he was thorough in his thinking, and then the Bible says he began to cry. Now notice this, he didn't have to, he didn't have to leave where he was at. Again, he, 
He has the ear of the king, the voice of the king. He's living in a palace. Is that, is that, does he have a good job? Is he living in a good place or a bad place? Very, very good. Access to the king, eating the best food. His place is probably like MTV Cribs or something. I mean, he had it going on. And he didn't have to leave a thousand miles from where he was at to go deal. He could have let somebody else do that. And what he does is he sits down and he begins, verse 4 says, and he begins to weep. I really believe this, that you'll never be effective at rebuilding anything until you learn how to empathize with people in need. You know, after the murder of George Floyd, I told you that I gathered six or seven African Americans in our church and we met in our conference room. And I just, I just said, hey, I, I want to hear your story. And then one by one in the room, just went around. Yeah, and, and almost all of the people that, from our church that I talked to said that they were called the N-word at one time that there was some kind of racial profiling, they got pulled over just for the color of their skin, that they were at a clothing store or a, at a mall and they were fo being followed around uh, just to, thinking that they were going to steal something. And one by one I heard their story and, and my heart not only broke, but I, I began to weep as I sat in my chair just trying to understand the injustice and the equality of it all. You know, when I first became a pastor, I, I, I would find out that somebody in our church that was suffering or even on their deathbed, and I'd get a phone call, and Pastor Steve, can you come and, and pray? And I would get so nervous in the car, I'd park my car, and I always felt like I had to say the exact perfect thing. Or, or what verse can I come up to really minister to this family during a time of need? And I, I'd say some of the dumbest things, and I discovered what people need during times of suffering and death isn't some nifty little phrase or even a Bible verse. They just need you to give them a big hug and say, I, don't, I can't even imagine what you're going through, but I'm here for you and I love you. And they just need you to empathize and to weep with them. Am I telling the truth? And this is what Nehemiah does. The first thing he does is he sits down and he, and he weeps because he was burdened. I want to ask you a question. Would you listen carefully? What are you, what are you burdened about? I mean, what, what are you really burdened about? Is anybody in the room burdened that that like kid, even kids in our church, in elementary and junior high, they're, they're being bullied just because they look a certain way or they might be a little bit overweight or like kids in our church, kids in our city being bullied, picked on, made fun of, laughed at, mocked for not being cool, not being an athlete, not being part of the popular crowd. Does that bother anybody? Does it bother you that, that women in our, in our, in our county, in, in, in our city are being sex trafficked? Are, are you bothered by the rights of the unborn? Or we just say, well, well somebody else deal with that. And, and are, you, are you bothered that, that ladies get raped? Are you bothered by physical abuse or sexual abuse or elder abuse? Like, what, what moves you? Our, our prayer should be that song that we used to sing, God, break my heart for the things that break yours. If you're like, well, I'm not really passionate about anything, then you need to ask God to break your heart for the things that break his. But I'm, what, what, like, what, what burdens you? What moves you? What, are you? what are you passionate about changing? Nehemiah, again, he could have stayed in the palace the rest of his life. No, but he sat down and he began to empathize with his people and weep. You know, years ago, I was in Bible college, and one of my friends uh, grew up in beautiful downtown Taft, California. How many have ever been to Taft? And I, I want to be really nice about Taft, but I, I was there a couple times. And like of all the cities that you can choose to live in in California, I'm not sure why people choose to live there. Please don't send me any, any emails. If you're offended, you can send them to Andy Ortega at New Life. Don't send them to No, no but I, I, ta, like, you go, you're like, how, how many have no idea where Taft is? Okay, you go to Hades. Um, you go 10 miles south and you're in Taft. No, just kidding. Uh, you go to Bakersfield and it's like an hour out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there's a couple oil rigs and there's really not a whole lot there. It's kind of dusty and don't be offended if you're from Taft. Please don't. I'm just saying I wouldn't choose to live there. But anyhow, my friend grew up in Taft and I was probably 21 years old. I got saved at the age of 19. And this is so cool though. His pastor, the church was small, 50 or 60 people. His pastor, who didn't even know me, asked to speak at his church on a Sunday morning. Who does that? Only a pastor in Taft. 
No, but I was really honored and thankful that he, he invited me to preach. So I, I went to this church on the weekend, and I preached at this very small church. Maybe 40 people were in the first service. And, and I, I can't believe, again, that he would even allow me. He didn't know me. I was just, I was only saved for two years. And I got up there, and it was a pretty pathetic sermon and stuff. So I preached at the first service, maybe 30 to 40 people. And there was this guy on the front row, and, and, uh, and uh, I don't know what his name was, but I, I just want to call him Mean Mike. Because no matter what I said, he would just sit there just like, and he just had like this scowl, and you could see like the veins in his face, just like ticked off about everything. And I would say something like funny to him. everybody's laughing. He's like, <laughs> just like, dude, like, and I found out later he was like on their leadership team, me and Mike. So the first service is over, and I go to the back to greet people on the way out, me and my friend Les, and me and Mike is standing right next to us. And we're like, hey, God bless you, God bless you. Everybody leaves, and now here comes the people for the second service. So we're all the, now we're greeting people coming into the second service. A gal, probably in her mid-20s, gets out of her car, starts walking to the front of the church, and it looked like, honestly, she slept in her car. No makeup, hair disheveled, obviously didn't take a shower. And I was grateful that she was there. She gets to the front, and me and Mike says to her, God is my witness. Can you go home and change your outfit because here... We believe that God is worth us dressing our very best. She turned around, got in her car, and sped off. And I, I made a promise that day, if I ever get the opportunity and the privilege to pastor a church, I want to pastor a church where it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, it doesn't matter how many tattoos you have, it doesn't matter if you had an abortion, you were in a gang. It doesn't, like you can have tats all over the place and even the big things in your ears. It doesn't matter. You are loved here. You are welcomed here. You are accepted here regardless of how you look. Can someone give me a loud amen in the house? Man, I got people like guys I work out at the gym with. I'm like, you got to come check out our church. They're like, no, man, if I came, the, like the walls would fall down. Like, like, how many, like, people say, well, I gotta, I gotta clean up first and get to church. What are you talking about? You just come as you are and Jesus will clean you up. You don't have to worry, like, like, he's not surprised by anything, by the way. I know, but I, like, I, I was in a gang, I shot two people, they actually killed, it's okay. I mean, let's, you want to just do a little Bible survey right now? David committed adultery and killed Bathsheba's husband. This like David, God after man, man after God's own heart, David wrote like a third of the Psalms. David, Saul, killed Christians before he became one. We can go on and on. And so our heart at New Life is, hey, we're just going to, all are welcome. You don't have to change anything about you. You just come as you are. God will change you. I love it. Nehemiah sat down and he empathized with the people of his time. Here's the second thing we need to do. We need to kneel down and pray. We need to sit down and, and weep. Number two, we need to kneel down and pray. Verse 4 B says, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Let me ask you a question. When is the last time you fasted? Fast, like how fast? No, fasted. To do without food. To focus on some spiritual thing, some breakthrough that you need, some stronghold. When's the last time you, you, you really sat down and you prayed about something? like passionately and boldly, you say, you know what? I'm not eating all day long. And the time that I would spend on my phone or watching TV or eating, I'm going to spend 30 minutes and just call out to God and ask him to move. That's what Nehemiah did. He, he, he got on his knees and he prayed. In fact, this is the very first prayer in the entire book. He, we're going to find him praying 12 different times. You know, we're going to also discover this guy's a master administrator, organizer. He's creative. He's a, he, I mean, he motivates people. He releases people. He empowers people. But he does everything that he does, he bathes it in prayer. And he says, hey, before I do anything, before I go anywhere, I got to kneel down and I got to get the heart of God. And the Bible says that he prayed and he fasted. Sit down to cry, kneel down to pray. How many would admit we have a lot of problems in America? Three people know that? Come on, we have a lot. Don't we have a lot of problems? And, but here's what I, I you read the newspaper, you, you get online, you follow Twitter, Instagram, like everybody, like, 
Yeah, we need a new president. We need also Democrats, well, it's the Republicans, it's the liberals, it's the conservatives, it's the politicians, it's the governor. We're just like, pow, pow. we're really good at pointing our fingers. We're really good at posting things and re-liking our favorite whoever. And I just wonder if we stop pointing so many fingers and we spent more time praying and fasting and seeking the face of God. If God wouldn't, as the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if we humble ourselves and pray that God will heal, heal, hear our prayers and heal our land. But we're too busy. Well, this, we're pointing fingers. And, no, here's the problem. You want to know what the problem is? I'm the problem. Let's start there. I'm the problem. Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me. God, forgive us for pointing fingers at all these other people. And by the way, I hope you know this, that there's no politician or any president that we might elect in the future. They're not the answer. Jesus Christ alone is the answer to the world. And we need to get on our knees and we need to humble ourselves and we need to pray. Has anybody ever been guilty of this like me? Like I've tried, I did A, I did B, I did C, I did Nothing where, okay, I think I'll pray about it. Anybody? Come on, don't, don't leave me up on the stage, please. But I wonder how insulting, how offensive that is to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the almighty and all-powerful, the God who says there's nothing impossible for me when he hears us saying, God, I, I, did, I did all these things and nothing else works. I guess I'll pray about it. He's like, are you kidding me? That should be the first, I, I should be the first one that you come to. And that's what Nehemiah does. He gets on his knees and he prays and he fasts and he calls out to God. Here's the third thing and the final thing. We need to stand up and act. We need to sit down and cry. We need to kneel down and pray. We need to stand up and act. Check out verse 4 and 5 of chapter 2. The Bible says, the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Notice, no delay, no doubt. After he did, he, he wept and empathized. After he prayed and fasted, then he said, no, it's time to go. My people are hurting. People are in bondage. The walls are broken down. The city is burning, and it's exposed. So he stood up and act. Let me ask you again. What, look at me, what bothers you? What bothers you? I'm not, I'm not saying... What kind of pet peeve do you have? How many of we all have pet peeves? How many have some pet peeves? I have some. Can I share a couple with you? Is this a safe place? Okay, this is safe. It's not going anywhere. Just a couple pet peeves. P please pray for me. People that drive on the f in the fast lane, on the freeway, the far left lane is the fast lane. Listen to me carefully. Because some of you, I get behind you and you have a new life sticker and far left lane is called the fast lane. That means you go fast. If you want to drive 55, stay over in the right lane, get out of my way, I am very busy, I got places to go, all right? How many get bothered by that? Have you ever driven out from Palm Springs to Phoenix? There's only two lanes, and then there's always the trucks in the right, and then there's this guy going 42 miles an hour. Would you please move over? So that's my pet peeve. Extend your hand this way and pray for me. Thank you. Hey, here's another. I get, to the, I get to the stop sign, right? I'm going to make a right turn at the stop sign. But I see a car coming this way. He's coming this way. And I don't want to pull off in front of him. So I'm like waiting, waiting, waiting. No blinker, no blinker. Waiting, waiting, wait. And then just at the last second, what does he do? He turns a right right there. That makes me mad. You, I could have saved like nine seconds. Um. Don't be offended. Pet peeve number three, people that get like really close to your space and talk to you. Hey, Pastor Dave, how you doing? Just like, <laughs> number one, you just had coffee, so you need to back up a little bit. Uh, give me my space, huh? There's, I have a lot of pet peeves. Sorry, I'm just going to vent here. When I go to the airport, I have a lot of pet peeves. Are, are people like clueless or what? And I think there should be like a dress code when you go to the airport. It's like people just like, I just woke up. Yeah, I know you did. Please put on some makeup before you get here. Anyhow, um, this bothered, like, because I'm, I'm like really like, I'm just like, I'm on a hurry. I'm go, let's go. And, and there's like a sign there, right? If you have liquids over eight ounces, please get rid of them. Get rid of your water bottles. Take, if you have an uh, iPad or a computer, what are you supposed to do? 
take them out of your bag and put them into another bin. If you're wearing shoes, please, right? There's a sign there. Then you get to the front, there's a guy saying the same thing. And then I always get behind the guy. He gets up and he's like, huh? Huh? He's got his shoes on. Now, do you have, uh, sir, do you have an iPad? Yeah, yeah. Why? Because the sign and I said it like 18 times, take it out. And so that, <laughs> that kind of drives me insane. Uh, here's another pet peeve that I have. I'm just going to keep going. Uh, people that don't know the words of the song, they just like mumble down. Eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine. You're like, actually, um, you could talk to my oldest daughter. I'm really guilty. Of, by the way, I went way back with that song, didn't I? Eight, six, seven, five, three. All the young people are like, what is he saying? Um, pet, but listen, pet, we all have pet peeves, right? I'm not saying pet peeves. So I'm talking, I'm like, what bothers you on an emotional, practical, or a spiritual level? Because you, you know what? I, we all have something that bothers us. Like, man, we should do something about, like, illiteracy. We should, do you know that, do you know that in 2020, 70,000 people will die in America because of drug overdose? You go to, like, big city, big city, 60, 70 percent of high school graduates cannot read at grade level. Little kids can't, can't, cannot read. Yeah, I hope somebody does something about it. Yeah, I, you know what? I, I, I got to call the church because I'm, I'm really passionate about fill in the blank and the church has got to do something. <laughs> who, who are you talking about? The church. The church needs to do something. I, I don't know, but who, who, who are you calling? I'm calling the church because we got to do something about fill in the blank. And here, you know what we're going to say? Oh, that's an awesome idea. Oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. Do you know that the Bible says in the book of Ephesians that you are the church? So how about this? If God gives you a burden or bothers you about something, you are probably the solution to it, not the church. Not the church. So what do you need to, hey, what do you need to stand up and act on? Nehemiah, again, he could have stayed back at the palace a thousand miles away and hoped that somebody else would stand up. But our culture has been filled with people that just refused to sit back and wait for somebody else like Rosa Parks. Excuse me, ma'am, you need to give up your seat for uh, this white guy that's coming on the bus. No, nope, not going to do that. No, nope. no. Nope. We call her like the mother of the civil rights movement. One of my heroes for sure is Martin Luther King. Not only a pastor, but a bold, passionate civil rights movement leader hero. He could have waited for somebody else to step up to the plate. No, but he stood up and he acted. I love, remember the story of Todd Beamer on the United Airlines when the terrorists were going to now take the plane and they've already knocked down two buildings and they're going to go to, I think, to the Pentagon or something. And remember his little phrase? He was on the plane and he said, let's roll. And they like tackled the terrorists and unfortunately the plane crashed and everybody on the plane. But that, what a great spirit. Let's roll. We need some people in new life to say, man, let's roll. You know, people in our church, like a lot of people in our church have lost their jobs, they're struggling financially. What if you got burdened about that and say, hey, I want to do something. How can we help? Or we could just sit back and say, well, I hope somebody in the church does something. I hope the church does something. And now one of my favorite missionaries of all time, a single girl from England, her name was Amy Carmichael. You should get her biography. It's amazing. Single young girl goes to India, and then in India, she starts working, listen, with temple prostitutes. So before they, you would go into a Hindu temple, you could have sex with these little young girls, and they were temple prostitutes, and she had a burden to reach the temple prostitutes, and one by one, she started ministering to them and leading them to Jesus, and one little girl became 10 little girls, became hundreds of little girls, and then she wanted to build an orphanage for these temple prostitutes. So she went to the contractor. She says, I want you to build me an orphanage for my temple prostitutes. He said, how much money do you have? She said, I have five cents. He said, oh, Amy Carmichael and five cents are going to build an orphanage? <laughs> she said, oh, I'm sorry. No, Amy Carmichael, five cents, and Jesus Christ are going to build an orphanage. And she did and rescued hundreds of little girls, and it's an amazing story. She could have stayed in England, played it safe, 
but she risked her life and seized an opportunity. This is all over the Bible too. One of my favorite stories is, you know, the guy that was paralyzed and four friends carried their friend to Jesus. Couldn't they have said, hey, I mean, Jesus lives around here. He's always walking up and down the street. Let's just wait till he comes and maybe he can come to the house. They could have done that. They could have said, hey, doesn't God hear our prayers from a distance? That's what we'll do. We'll just like kneel down in the living room because God answers prayer for sure. And we'll just pray that God from a distance, and they could have done that, but no, no, no. They got their friend up on a mat. They're like, no, we're taking our friend to Jesus. They got to the house. It was packed out and they said, we're going through the roof. And the woman with the issue of blood, 12 years, she was bleeding. Man, if I can, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. Man, like never before, do we, is there a prime opportunity to stand up and do something? What has God put on your heart? Who, who better to, listen, who better to reach gangbangers than somebody that was in a gang? I mean, I, I can share and I can give some, but I, I was born in, West, I, was, I grew up in Westlake Village. I'm going to go up to Folsom. Hey, what's up, man? Yeah, it's pretty rough in Westlake Village. Now, probably God's going to use somebody that was in a gang. Who, listen, ladies, who better to minister to somebody that's thinking about having an abortion than somebody that had one? Who better to reach someone that's on drugs than someone who used to be an addict? Here's what I don't want. I don't, I don't want the sermon to be, oh, that was great. And we just walk out and we don't do anything. I want you to, like, like today and this week, like, what do you just need to sit down and really think about and weep over? Just the injustice, the inequality, racism. What do you, what do you need to, like, specifically pr- pray and fast about this week? Now, what, what do you need to stand up and act on? Because some of you, like, he's bothered you about something, and then you're just like, well, I'm too young, or I'm a female, or I'm single, or I don't have enough money, and you've pushed it down, you've suppressed it, you've justified it, and it's time to act. God wants to use you. So would you stand to your feet so I can pray for us? Thank you, Jesus. If you're watching online, just heads, heads bowed and eyes closed. In fact, if you're watching online, I'd ask you to stand to your feet as well. Father, we ask you to bother us. Give us a burden. Jesus, you looked on Jerusalem and your word says that you wept with compassion because they were sheep without a shepherd. God, help us to weep over our city, weep over the lost, weep over the mission field, weep over the abortion clinic, weep over hopelessness, homelessness, Weep over addicts. God, give us your heart. Break our heart for the things that break yours, oh God. But God, this would be a message that we would put into practice. Because James says if we just walk out here and don't put it into practice, we've deceived ourselves. We've lied to ourselves. So bother us, we pray, until we're moved to action. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, amen. Hey, I'm Steve Abraham, the pastor of New Life Oxnard. Thank you for watching our YouTube channel. You can join us live every Sunday for a new sermon and live worship. Also, be sure to take a minute to subscribe and turn on your post notifications so you don't miss any of our new videos or live streams. And please share with a friend. And if you would like to partner with us in furthering the gospel, please click the link below. Don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching and God bless you.